Um, you, you're you speaking about your records and you're speaking about your um, experience as an, a signed artist, but how did you even get your record deal? Because even as you're talking, I know Beastie Boys preceded you. I, I, I can't remember, and you could correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, I can't remember any other white Caucasian hip hop artists that were signed and were doing well um, prior to third base. But more important, third base came in and it wasn't about skin color. Yes, on the outside you were white, but y'all were all the way hip hop. What Beastie Boys were doing, they were rapping for sure, but it wasn't necessarily done for the black culture. And in their own right, they opened us up to so much of what was going on uh, within white culture, middle America. So I'll give them that for sure. But was, am I missing anything? Like were there other groups that I'm just not thinking about that were white that were doing their thing during that time? So you, well, I think there's a slight difference. So I'll break it down into A, were there white groups? Yes. There was uh, our friend, mutual friend, John Schechter, who ran the source. <clears throat> he was in a group on select records called BMOC, Big Men on Campus. Yep, yep, yep. forgot and, about, yep. Um, Todd Ray, uh, the producer, was in a group called uh, Something Boys. They were signed, they signed uh, to a label. Um, Everlast was signed. He had Forever Everlasting. Uh, don't you know, so was, was, Ever, was Everlast signed at the same time of you or was after you? Before. Before us. Okay. Yeah. Um, dope new styles of rhyme breaking signs. Down with the rhyme, send the kid a line. You're on a tip like crack of a whip. You know what I'm saying about ships and slips of the lip. Yo, he was dope. Everlast was dope. Always been dope. Um, but none of them had like levels of success. Everlast had a level of success because his video was dope and it played forever. And hip hop heads loved that record. But I want to also go back to one thing you said. <clears throat> there was one record, really one record, Hold It Now, Hit It, that really banged everywhere. And it made me mad as all get out. Yeah, I'm a chill wheelchair when it's out the bill and I'm filled my pocket with not a dollar bill. Seven out the Yo, Red Alert used to bang down in the quarter and yeah. I'd be tight. I would be tight. Because they play that three times and maybe my little single Hey Boy would get played a half. And I'd be happy. They play Hold It Now, Hit It to Death. There was a period of time between Cookie Puss and Hold It Now, Hit It where there was this thing that the Beasties were doing that kind of skirted between the punk rock side of it where they started and then the hip hop side. And then, you know, obviously License Sale comes out and it changes the way even hip hop is even perceived Correct. Uh, by, by, by pop culture and by, you know, the Dick Clarks of the world and all of that. Um, we were obviously not that, you know. Um, I was a kid who was a battle MC. They were not battle MCs. I was a kid who was you know dodging bullets at Vandermeer projects. They were obviously not that, even though they were from Brooklyn. You know, I was going to Prospect Park and and on Mecca on 125th Street and building with the gods and the earths, and they were not doing that. So my perception of the other side of hip hop culture from a density standpoint was very intense. And my rhyme flow, my patterns were all based on different levels of degrees that I was receiving from the people that were around me. Um, and the importance for me in that was, there was, I felt not only a credibility that we had that no one else had, but we had a level of real that no one else could take away from us. Um, you know, when Just Ice says, I know I was there, like in his record with KRS. Like, yep. yeah, I was there. Like, I was there. I was the Forrest Gump of hip hop. Like, I was everywhere. Um, because I had no choice. Because if I failed, 
my mother was going to kick me out and send me back to college. And that meant I was going to be a shoe salesman for the rest of my life. And the only time I would see you, Sean Prez, is when you're bringing your beautiful woman to Nordstrom. And I'd say, good afternoon, Mr. Prez. Would you like that in a seven or an eight in brown or black? You know, because that's that was my path. That was it. Hip hop gave me everything. It gave me not only the music and the touring and the worldly vision at 23 years old, but it allowed me to be able to build things because I was able to connect to an audience. I understood what that meant. I understood what it would take. I didn't have to go get an MBA in marketing to understand that connecting with an audience came down to credibility, believability, and a message that could resonate. And I became really good at that. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.